number 13 is where we're going to spend our time. I'm going to invite you to, to hang out there and uh, join us as we um, dive into uh, the text that declares to us uh, in many different ways the power of the kingdom of God. Uh, for the last several weeks, we have been uh, really thinking deeply about what does it mean for us to take seriously <clears throat> um, the, the values, the impulses, uh, the, the core uh, truths of our church uh, that remind us that we are indeed home. Uh, that when we come to the way, we want to be in a space and a place where we can declare that we are at home one with another. What does it mean for us uh, to take seriously that uh, some of our work at the church has to be around de our spirituality, our faith, our, our theological assumptions, uh, that there is much that attaches itself to Christian uh, faith, uh, to praxis, if you will, but one of the things that we are invited to do the whole of our lives is to de-churchify, decolonize, to in reality be sanctified uh, after the ways of Jesus so we can be more like Christ. Then we always, of course, have a strong impulse of justice, but it is not something that is because of our particular uh, uh, altruistic tendencies. Uh, justice is what love looks like in the public. And for many of us, we know that justice also uh, is the lifeblood of how we survive day to day. Um, that if the world is not just for our families and for our communities, then many of us will not even have the opportunity to have the kind of life that has been uh, given to us by our creator. And so home, dechurchification, justice. Today we're going to talk about spirituality. And Matthew chapter number 13 is where we're going to spend our time. Uh, verse number 31, Jesus is giving all kinds of wonderful parables. Parables are these uh, very simple ways of expressing and explaining very divine, profound truths. And so we find in this text, Jesus talking about the parable of the sower. Jesus speaking to an agrarian, a farming kind of culture, a culture where people have to make almost everything of, of significance with their hands. That uh, in many respects, they are people who know what it means to have to invest in a certain kind of process in order to achieve or benefit a certain kind of result. And Jesus, uh, speaking about the kingdom of God over and against the empire of Rome, talking to people who are experiencing the very worst of the powers of this age, Jesus is inviting them to participate in the inbreaking of a new way of life, a new kingdom, kingdom, a new order that is indeed led, ushered, and dare I say, uh, existing under the reign, R-E-I-G-N, of God. And this is indeed who we are and what we are. We want to believe this. So Matthew chapter 13, verse 31, I think they're going to bring the, 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 the subject onto the screen. So uh, come on, let's read, read together. The scripture says, uh, and Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, verse 45, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls and finding one pearl of great value, he goes and sells all that he has and buys it. Verse 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. And when it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down and put the good fish into the baskets, but threw out the bad. 
So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh, Jesus giving them the real deal. Verse 51, have you understood all this? They answered and they say, yes. Jesus says to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. We're going to take a few moments to talk about the dangers of useless religion. The dangers of useless religion. Bow your heads and let's pray together. God, we want to say thank you, Lord, for the word of God that has been hidden in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And I pray, Lord, that you will send your anointing that makes the preaching and the teaching easy. May it rest upon me. And even the hearers of your word, and we'll say thank you, Lord, in all these things we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Amen. The dangers of useless religion. Dr. King says it like this, that any religion that professes to be concerned about the souls of men and is not concerned about the economic conditions that damn them, the slums that damn them, the economic conditions that strangle them, and the social conditions that cripple them is a spiritually moribund religion awaiting burial. What do you think about that for a second, right? Dr. King really coming with a clarifying description of what useless religion, useless spirituality, useless faith, looks like, particularly in a time of great conflict, that if you have faith, religion, spirituality, that professes to be concerned about the souls of people, but not concerned about the social conditions that erode the soul, then it is indeed the case that that kind of religion is awaiting burial. James 1.27 powerfully declares that religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. That in many respects, our task has been for the last 15 years making a commitment to follow Jesus, not in the abstract, but in the particular, because sometimes our abstraction of faith and religion and spirituality can cause you and I to let ourselves and others off the hook for what it means to live as a follower of Jesus in a world where Jesus gave himself as a example, a, a, a expression of love lived out loud, that Jesus is our model, thus we call ourselves the way, not the way of McBride or the way of Pastor Tanisha or the way of Pastor Donna or, or Erna or, 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 or any other uh, name that has graced these pulpits over the last 15 years. We are all followers of the way. And when God gave me the vision of the church to build, we needed to be a church that leaned into the best of our traditions, where Jesus remains the subject and love is always our action. Where our intellect is not erased from us as we pursue the ways of Jesus. Nor is our vision diminished because we have a over preoccupation with heaven or an over preoccupation with earth. That we are people empowered by the spirit that is unleashed and poured out as Joel chapter 2 says on all flesh. That that's how we describe the way, particularly in our earliest 
years, that we were a church that was loving and intellectual and visionary and empowering. And 15 years later, we continue to lean into this, this reality that to be a follower of the way, particularly in a world that was different in 2005. I mean, George Bush was still the president back then. Amen. And, and, and our marching in the streets back then was to end immigration uh, uh, deportations that were happening. And, and we had not yet seen the Barack Obama. Our political system was unraveling in a different kind of way. And, and there was all this hope that you could believe in coming onto the horizon. Our city looked different. We still had Folks, black folks, Latino folks, uh, folks who were uh, 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 under-resourced, low income, still living in Berkeley and Oakland. Folks had not yet been displaced. Our church looked different because we had a whole lot of younger folks from the neighborhood and families from the neighborhood. And 15 years later, now them young folk got kids and families. We had university students, bright-eyed, bright-eyed showing up trying to figure out how to make life work. And 15 years later, we are still following the way. How do we follow Jesus most faithfully in this perilous season is our greatest question. Because the crux of spirituality is indeed what you and I, as followers of the way, must continue to wrestle with. I remember my first course of spirituality when I was in seminary or Bible college, one of them places, and, and, and they told me spirituality was described as that which animates a person's life of faith, that which moves a person's faith to greater depths and perfection. Then we said that Christian spirituality was a set of beliefs found in the creeds and doctrines of the church, a set of values based on hope and promise of redemption, the love of others, the denial of self. Christian spirituality was a way of life, the real human life in which our beliefs and values are embodied and expressed. And so at the end of our class, we put it all together and we describe Christian spirituality is the quest for a fulfilled and authentic life. That involves taking the beliefs and values of Christianity and weaving them into a fabric of our lives so that they animate, provide the breath and spirit and fire for our lives. Christian spirituality was the integration then of what it meant to have faith but also have a, a, a life that made faith come alive. And then, you know, I kept going down the journey and, and I started to dive into some of the womanist theologians and, and, and none greater than Dolores Williams. And I love this, 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 this way that Dolores Williams, particularly as someone who's grown up in holiness, Pentecostal sensibilities, she says it like this, that there can be no holiness, no unity and no Catholicity of the Christian church until it identifies itself in active opposition to all forms of violence against humans, against nature, against the environment, and against the land. That the, the contribution of womanist theology, black women, over the course of the history of our sojourn here in America has been to excavate the real life experiences of those black women who have had to endure uh, the worst of, of, of slavery and Jim Crow and, and violence that is racialized but still cry out to a God who we believe hears our prayers. That it wasn't enough to have Christian spirituality uh, discussed from an intellectual point of view and leave out the experiential. That putting all of this together is so important. Why? Because it is the kind of spirituality we must have if our faith is not going to be useless in an environment where we got way too much useless Christianity on display. I mean, we got Christianity on display in the world and particularly in our country in ways that make you believe some folk must not have ever met Jesus, much less read what Jesus said. I do believe 
that it is important for you and I to keep reminding ourselves that the words of Jesus that have shown up this morning exposes and illuminates the utility of the gospel, the function, the work of the gospel that is happening both within us and around us. I want you to, to remind yourself consistently that through the course of your life, a Christian spirituality that is vibrant is always working within you. It is always working around you, and it is always working beyond you. Anybody believe that today, that the Spirit is at work inside you? The Spirit is at work around you. The Spirit is at work beyond you. The Spirit's doing something on the inside of you that nobody else could do. Do I have a witness up in here today? The Spirit of God is doing some stuff around you that nobody else can do. The Spirit is at work beyond you in ways you can't even fully appreciate or understand. And Jesus, in the text, is always inviting you and I not to be an agent of useless religion, of feckless spirituality, of an ineffectual gospel. No, Jesus speaks in the text and he uses the language like kingdom in the text to juxtapose, to, to contradict, to demonstrate that there's another way of life rather than the way of the empire called Rome. And, and, and just like Jesus was speaking with particular language back then to try and jar the people who he was speaking to, we must continue to use language today that continues to jar our sensibilities so we don't fall in to useless religion. Because there is a way to use the language of scripture, the language of faith, to create a performance of religion that leaves the soul still unsaved. Lord, help me in here today. I mean, it is quite a wicked luxury to pastor churches or, or to be part of churches that have no burden to preach justice. It is a wicked luxury to have a church that won't disciple people away from racism or human hierarchy or dissuade state actors from being agents of violence in this country or in countries across the world. That's useless religion where you come to a building and think that that is the fullness of what it means to follow God, where you turn church attendance into an idol. And spend money trying to fight orders that are meant to save your life. Because you think a building is more important than the body God gave you. That's useless religion. Where you praise, praise, and worship, worship. That's useless religion. Where you elevate the preaching of the word over the living out of the word. That is useless religion where we are more consumed about going to the church and forget that we are called to be the church and if we ever needed a spirituality that's useful or a gospel that's vibrant and incarnational in the soil of life and experience we need that kind of spirituality today you ought to just put in the chat and say, I need some useful spirituality. I need some useful spirituality that produces life and that multiplies love and that, and that unleashes peace. I don't need a useless religion. And this is then what you and I have to contend with in this moment. Because it can be easy to get caught up in useless religion. It can be easy to use religion to, to, to numb the effects of the kind of compounding traumas and epidemics that we have among us. No child of God that these epidemics, the, 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 the COVID-1619, I'll call it, amen, the, 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 the disease of white supremacy and the disease of, of the ways in which we have turned the, the, the world upside down and, and have coded human hierarchy, racism, sexism, the ways that we continue to perform homophobia, transphobia, negrophobia, the ways that we continue to be comfortable with violence and criminalization, that in and of itself was already a heavy cross for some of us to bear. 
But then Donald Trump and all of his sycophants come into power and, and, and they unleash a different kind of wickedness that bleeds to Trumpism and Christo-fascism. And it has created an existential crisis for the world. And then we got 2020 that came. Lord have mercy. How many of you wish we could just, like, like Nyla told me, Daddy, can we just skip to 2021? Because I'm tired of 2020. Amen. Although I, I saw a news, newspaper clip that said we may finally see if the aliens are showing up this year. <laughs> you ought to tell your neighbor, oh, 2020, go away. Amen. Amen. But, but 2020 is here and it unleashed the global pandemic called COVID-19. It unleashed oh, all these continuous murders. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDay, Dominique Fells, Ahmaud Arbery, and all of this has come to a, 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 a moment of, 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 of tipping points where now people are in the streets and, and Trump is unleashing shock troops and people are still in this moment holding on to useless religion. I want you to know that that is not the witness of the way. We here at the way are celebrating our anniversary, but we're celebrating the way of Jesus and how the way of Jesus requires us to examine what kind of church we going to be. What kind of Christ follower are you going to be? What kind of kingdom of God are we ushering in over and against the empire of this world? And I want you to know that it is coming. The kingdom is coming. You ought to just put that in the chat and say the kingdom is coming. The kingdom, the kingdom is coming. Now, Jesus uses powerful parables to help make the metaphors of the kingdom more accessible. And I want you to keep telling and reminding yourself that the power of this useful spirituality, the strength of the emerging kingdom is both within us, it's around us, and it's beyond us. And I love how Jesus makes it plain for everybody to see. And I think we're going to spend a few more weeks unpacking all of these metaphors for our learning. But, but let me just run down a few of them because I find them to be so powerful. Verse 33 says that Jesus described the kingdom of heaven like a woman, big mama in the kitchen cooking, and she uses yeast. She uses yeast to, to, to help leaven out the bread. And, and I love how one of the, the church fathers, he said it like this, that when the leaven, though it is buried in the bread, it is not destroyed. The leaven, little by little, transmute the whole lump into its own condition. And that's what happens when the gospel is buried in our hearts. That the three passions of the human soul are blended into one so that in reason, listen, we possess prudence. And in anger, we possess hatred toward vice. And in desire, we possess the aspiration that reaches for virtue. That in many respects, the, 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 the kingdom of God is buried in our hearts. Why? Because it's trying to get as deep into your life as possible to begin to transform you from the inside out. Ooh, I don't know about you, but I need a little bit of that transformation from the inside out. I need the kingdom to be cooked into my life. I need the spiritual practices of Jesus to be cooked into my life. Just like Big Mama be in the, in the, in the kitchen and you see Big Mama just, mm, baby, you know, just rocking. Some of y'all don't even know what a Big Mama is. Amen. Amen. But, but just, just use your imagination. Amen. Big Mama knows how to do things with, with food that, that don't need a recipe. She, she's been around long enough where she knows how much this and how much that. A dash of this and a dash of that. And she uses her hands in ways to make sure that the ingredients of the dough or the peach cobbler uh, crust. Somebody say amen. That big mama knows what to do in the kitchen with the ingredients that she has. Can you imagine that the spirituality that has been unleashed in your life knows what to do in your family? Knows what to do with your children. Knows what to do with your career or your vocation. The spirituality knows how to infiltrate the parts of your lives that you thought were off limits that nobody else could handle. This is what God's spirituality seeks to do in our lives. 
Oh, Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field where someone found it and hid it. Why? Because they didn't want anybody else to come and sneak it away. And then that person goes and sells everything they have to get this one field to get the treasure. I want you to just think about the many ways that the kingdom of heaven is like treasure that has been buried in your life under all of the the, the challenges and the struggles that people have tried to bury you as as they say, but they didn't know that you were seeds and, and that even as they threw dirt on you, that dirt was creating the condition for a treasure to be unearthed in your life. They, they were burying you, but they didn't understand that that treasure, even with the dirt on it, still had the same value as it had when it was first created, that you and I are like treasures and the kingdom of heaven has been buried in us so it could one day be discovered Woo, think about what happens when you discover treasure I love how the scripture it says it so powerfully that the person who found the treasure buried in the field went and sold everything they had to get the field so they could get to the treasure Can you imagine what it means to have the free gift of salvation that is so priceless that even though it costs you nothing, it still costs you everything? That the value of this treasure is an inevitable process of transformation on the inside that leads to transformation on the outside. Or the Spirit says that the kingdom is like mustard seeds that are planted in soil. Well, I like the mustard seed analogy because a little old mustard seed that looks so insignificant can become a great Big tree with shrubs and branches that others, birds, can find a place to live and to dwell and call home. I feel like that's a good metaphor for the way throughout the years that we have been a place that that even though it it has been a place of small and insignificant beginnings that over the last 15 years we can look across the country and across the world and we can see that branches have grown from the way. And some of those branches have created some places of home and and places of belonging and places of healing and places of hope and, and places of love and places of freedom and places of liberation that people can find some dwelling places in. And, and, and it didn't seem like it was going to be significant at the beginning, but as long as the tree kept on growing, it kept on providing space for others to find their place. And this is what I want you to take away from my message today that that you are like the kingdom of God you are a treasure and you are like mustard seeds you are a person we are a people that have been produced and cultivated by the power of the living God and as long as we keep seeing ourselves as the treasures we are then the usefulness of this treasure becomes a source of power for those who are at the margins for those who are looking for the uncreated one who calls himself a a Yahweh and Adam and Elohim the one who has been revealed throughout history through a people called Israel and have come to us and to them and to those in many different names but we call his name Jesus you ought to holler right in your house Jesus Uh, ain't there something about that name Jesus Uh, that this is the usefulness of our spirituality Uh, that the spirituality that derives from the man named Jesus Uh, it does some work on you and I on the inside Uh, it is buried in our hearts Uh, and the faith that is produced from the burial Uh, It creates a certain kind of performance in the world. I love how Walter Hawkins and them used to say it. They said it like this. What is this? 
that makes me feel the way that I feel? What is this that makes people think I'm mad and I'm strange? What is this that makes me feel like I can run on in Jesus' name? Whatever it is, whatever it is, whatever it is, it won't let me hold my peace. It goes on to say that it makes me love all my enemies. I'm talking about a useful uh, spirituality. Uh, it makes me uh, love all my friends. Uh, I'm talking about uh, a useful uh, spirituality. Uh, and it won't uh, let me be ashamed uh, to tell the world uh, that I've been born again. Uh, what is this uh, that is on the inside? Uh, that's been buried like a treasure. I want you to know it's the useful spirituality. It's the saving spirituality. It is the way of Jesus that has been gifted to you and I. So don't you dare throw away your confidence. Don't you dare go to the left or to the right. But stay right along in here. The road is going to get tough. And the road is going to get rough. And the hills make it hard to climb. But I decided a long time ago that I'm going to throw in my lot with the people of God. With the suffering. With the dispossessed. With the marginalized. I believe that the good Good news of Jesus uh, can get down on the inside. Uh, just like my dad used to sing a song uh, that said something uh, on the inside working uh, its way to the outside. Uh, oh, uh, somebody say, oh, uh, oh, uh, what a change in my life. Uh, then it got so good to you uh, that you started tapping your feet. Uh, and then you said the Holy Ghost uh, on the inside. Uh, Lord, I feel like preaching in here. Uh, working its way uh, on the outside. Uh, oh, uh, I hear my daddy saying it. Uh, oh, uh, what a change in my life. Uh, then you said Jesus, uh, he's on the inside. Uh, and he's working uh, on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. This is the usefulness of our spirituality. That it changes me. It changes the community. It changes the home. It changes the politics. It changes the death. It changes the sickness. It changes the hopelessness. It changes the depression. It changes injustice. It brings down the systems. It uplifts the people. It unleashes the kingdom. It dismantles the empire. This is the usefulness of our faith. So keep practicing it. Keep believing. Keep hoping. Keep standing on the promises of God our Savior. I refuse to have a useless religion when I got the power of the living God deep down moving up being unleashed in the world. This is the spirituality of the way. Shout hallelujah. The spirituality of the way is one that requires us to see ourselves as connected to the spirituality of Jesus. And I want you to know that no matter how long you've been following Jesus, whether you are the Catholic Church, the Methodist Church, the Coptic Church, the Pentecostal Church, the Baptist Church, or no church, the spirituality of Jesus is always pushing you. It's always calling out our vices, our contradictions, 
It's always making you have sleepless nights when you aren't in the will of the living God. It's always calling in your economics. It's always calling in your politics. It's always calling in your theology. It's always calling in your practices. The spirituality of Jesus don't let anybody off the hook. But all of us, described in different ways, whether it is treasure, whether it is mustard seed, whether it is yeast, or the final one says that it is like a net cast into the sea that brings fishes out and they sit on the shore and they separate the good from the bad. Oh, child of God, may the spirituality of Jesus that manifests at the way continue to separate our lives, the parts of our lives that are in need of transformation. May it, God, pull us into more faithfulness so we may be a people who can serve you more faithfully, love you and your people more dearly, and bear witness in a world that is indeed crumbling right before our eyes. As the world falls down, may we, the people of God, stand up. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. God, I pray for the people of the way who are here today and listening to this message on this, our culminating day of 15 years of ministry. Thank you for all of those, God, who have indeed made a significant impact. Thank you for my wife, Sharice, Lord God, and all of the sacrifices she has made and we have made as a family over these 15 years. Lord God, trying to serve your people in ways that please you, God, I pray that, Lord, the acknowledgement of this milestone will continue to be an acknowledgement of her and our family's great commitment to your people. I pray, Lord God, for the founding families of our church who have continued over the years to be great expressions of selflessness and sacrificial living. I thank you for the givers, Lord God, who continue week to week for 15 years giving of their little or their much to sustain this ministry that has blessed thousands. I thank you, God, for the freedom fighters, the justice warriors that have come through our church over the years and have continued, Lord God, to pull down terrible schools and reconstruct new spaces of learning that have stopped gun violence in our communities, that have registered people to vote and signed folks up for the census, that have provided food and clothing and shelter, Lord, to the unhoused, that have embraced our queer loved ones and reminded them that they are created in the image of God and that they have a home in your kingdom and in your, your service. I thank you, Lord God, for all of those, Lord, who have wept with those who have wept and have mourned with those who have mourned and who have rejoiced with those who have rejoiced. Thank you, because that is the spirituality of our church, to be incarnational to unleash the spirit of the living God in ways that heal the sin-sick soul. I pray, God, that you will continue to cultivate, animate, and expand our spirituality. May our arms never get too short where we can't embrace in a wider circle, Lord God, those who you call us to love and to serve and to walk with. I pray, God, that even as Many of us find ourselves in tensions, Lord God, living out contradictions, Lord God, of our family, of this country, of our health and our mental sensibilities, our careers, Lord God, things that are constantly shifting and changing. May you remain the constant in our lives, the one who is able to hold us, to strengthen us, and to give us what we need. So bless us, God, on this, the anniversary month as we 
launch into year 16. May it be greater than the years before. May new leaders and new pastors and new, Lord God, members and new servants and new, Lord God, volunteers, may they just start popping up all over, Lord God, the soil that is the way. Bless Pastor Jaslyn, Lord God, and the way LA and all of the many ways, Lord God, that they are, Lord, tilling the ground, Lord, among the most, Lord, seeking and vulnerable people in South uh, LA and Southern California. Bless their whole team and Lord, keep giving them what they need, Lord God, as they continue to proclaim the way, Lord God, down in LA. Lord, all of these blessings, we're asking you to make yourself known to us. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. I want you to know, people of the way, that I love you so much. We love you so much. The idea that we have made 15 years is such a humbling, humbling milestone, you know. But I know that there's so much more for us to do. So I hope that you continue to see yourself as a part of this great ministry, this great family, this great movement of Jesus in this region. And dare I even say in parts of the country, some of our loved ones are in New York and Atlanta and Indianapolis and Chicago. Some folk are in uh, Minneapolis tuning in. We got folks in Kenya who find themselves members of the way. And, and, and we love all of you, all points in between. Keep staying on the way of Jesus, step by step, day by day. And the blessings of God will be ours. They will be extended to you and yours. And all that the Lord has called in Jesus' name.